Well, that's an exciting morning so far, isn't it? Well, you know what? God has a little more excitement for us. Maybe a few more fireworks that are going to come right out of this book right here. You ready for some fireworks? You ready to go? Let's do it. All right. Today we are concluding our 10-week study through the book of Judges. How many of you have enjoyed that? Come on. Do you enjoy that? You know, in the beginning of the study, we just had, you know, a small percentage of hands that went up that said, yeah, I've heard a whole, a whole sermon series on judges. Now, all of y'all's hands can go up, and next time that is asked. The book of Judges has been so eye-opening, and I believe such an important message for us with the world and with the situations we're dealing with right now, right here in this nation. I mean, isn't it amazing? Wow, how God's word is like alive and applicable to, to like us today? Anyway, that was a rhetorical question, but it, but it is, right? So the title of today's message, the last in this series, is The Danger of Being Unrestrained. See where we're going with this? The Danger of Being Unrestrained. And if you've read the last four chapters of the book of Judges, chapter 17 through 21, then you, like me, probably finish this Old Testament book uh, with this thought, dude, those people are messed up. If you haven't read those last four chapters, go read those after church, and you'll say the same thing. Dude, those people are messed up. So we're going to look at, man, why were they so messed up? What happened? And does this apply to us today? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> anyway, there are two reasons, two key reasons that the nation of Israel was, was messed up. And Scripture is going to help us understand that. Because uh, how did this nation... How did the people of God, this nation that, that honored God, that, that worshiped him, that glorified him, how did they all of a sudden become out of control? Like to the point of abusing and killing one another. So is this applicable to us today? Do you think so? I, I think it's definitely applicable. We're going to see it all over the place here. Point number one, let's dive in. No leader, no direction, no restraint, no good. Point number one, you got no leader, you got no direction, then you're going to have no restraint, and that is no good. Or as some folks say, that ain't good. That just ain't good. Judges uh, chapter 17 through 21, they were dark days in the history of God's people in the nation of Israel. I'm calling them days of confusion. You're going to see this. I mean, these were days of confusion in the nation of Israel. Again, sound familiar? Maybe. Anybody? 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 Anybody ever, you know, like, open your eyes when you go out in the world and see, yeah, days of confusion, right? Days of confusion. I mean, the lines between good and evil, right and wrong, completely had been erased in the nation of Israel. I mean, they got to the point where making and worshiping idols, check, that's cool. That's cool. Rape, ah, that's all right. Just an expression people had, you know, of, of life, you know. That's okay. Homosexuality, yeah, let's celebrate it. This is the nation of Israel back here, the end of Judges, all right? I'm not talking about today. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe, anyway. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> greed was the norm back in the day here. Murder was a way of life. Days of confusion. Days of confusion. Those living in sin were demanding tolerance. Huh? Never heard of such a thing. They were demanding tolerance, man. I mean, anybody who had an alternative lifestyle, do it, do it. We tolerate that. We love it. Until those tolerant people were the most tolerant people until they ran into people who wanted to honor God. And then they became all of a sudden intolerant. But they called that intolerance tolerance somehow. Again, this is going on in the nation of Israel back at the end of the book of Judges. This, I'm not talking about today, you know, everything's great today, everything's cool. Anyway, all right, it does sound a lot like today, doesn't it? But it really was, Judges, chapter 17 through 21. But it is today, and I would say that today, I think we've even surpassed the end of the book of Judges. I mean, when you read these last four chapters, you really do say, dude, that's messed up. I cannot believe that kind of stuff was going on in that nation but if we open up our eyes, we understand that kind of stuff and like to the next level is going on in our nation today. Like the next level stuff, the next level of confusion and evil happening in our nation today. We got to open up our eyes to that. And I know we're starting to see it. 
devil's overplaying his hand. I believe that. I believe that. Not only do we have this thing of tolerance, but um, if, if you don't go along with tolerance, if you don't go along with the ways of the world and what they declare is acceptable, then not only will they not tolerate us, but they will, call, they will cancel us. Have you ever heard of that? You all know cancel culture, right? If you're breathing, if you're live, you know, cancel culture. That's going on. If you don't agree with political correctness, we'll cancel you. You don't get on board with these new enlightened, you know, philosophies of socialism and Marxism and and critical theory. And if you don't get on board with the social movements, you know, that are coming from who knows, I mean, craziness, then we'll cancel you. You're canceled. Days of confusion are here. They're alive and well unfortunately. Scripture in the book of Judges gives us some clarity why these things were happening. Why was the nation of Israel out of control? And again, I think, I know we can apply this to our lives in our nation today. In Judges chapter 17, beginning verse 6, Scripture says, in those days, Israel had no king. 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 Now, why did I say that four times? Because in the last four chapters of the book of Judges, it says that four times. I think God wants us to understand something from that. In those days, Israel had no king. In other words, these people, they didn't have a leader. There was no, no king, there was no leader, there was no judge at the time, these last four chapters in the book of Judges. No leader. And no leader meant no direction, and no direction meant no restraint, and a good, and again, that ain't good. That just, that just doesn't work. So I believe the Lord wants us to take a peek at, at the importance of leadership in our lives and in our nation today. Leadership is important. But the right leader is the most important. And I'm not going to get political on this. I'm really not. You'll see where this goes. Right? You're going to see where, where God takes us on this. We understand the lack of godly leadership results in a lack of godly direction, which resulted for the people of Israel in a whole lot of sin that was actually leading to death. These people were aimless, man. I mean, they thought they knew it all. They thought they had it all together. And they would go like headlong one direction. Whoa, let's go, let's go, let's go. This is the right way to go. And boom, they'd hit a dead end. But they would just turn around and just pick some other random direction to go that they thought was awesome. And they would go that direction, hit a dead end. Not learn anything, just turn around and go another wrong direction time and time again. They were going, but they were going nowhere. And here's the deal. There are a lot of people in our world today. There are even a lot of Christians in our world today in the same condition, condition. A lot of people on the fast track, man. I mean, we're a nation of being on the fast track, aren't we? Racing through life, busier than ever. Man, we're going. We're going, we're going, we're going, we're going. But you know what? So many people are going, but they're going nowhere fast. They're caught up in the rat race of life. And what's going on? They're worn out. They're broken. They they lack vision. They lack purpose. They're missing the mark. They're missing God in all of this. And so they're making bad decisions. I mean, like horrible decisions heartbreaking decisions in their lives. They're hurting themselves. Sometimes they don't know it. Sometimes they do. But they're hurting themselves. They're hurting others. And often it's leading to the place of depression and even suicide. And I want to talk about this just for a moment. Because this is no joke in our society today. Depression. I mean, this is where brokenness, this is where it leads to when we're going all different directions. And we're missing the mark. I mean, we just become depressed. Like things start seeming dark and useless and hopeless. And I just want to say, anybody here in this room today, anybody watching this, if you're dealing with any form of depression, oh, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. 
If you ever find yourself in those kind of those dark moments where you're just falling back into that cave and, and you're hearing those voices and you're feeling like worthless and, and it feels hopeless, you need to talk to somebody. And I want to invite you to call us at the church. Talk to me. Talk to one of the pastors. We want to talk to you. This is, this is no joke. This isn't just kind of some little light and momentary, we'll get past this on our own, you know, just fight our way out of it. There's a pastor just this last week in Nashville, Tennessee. I mean, Holy Ghost filled, on fire for Jesus, pastor in Nashville, committed suicide. Struggled with depression, but didn't let anybody know. Didn't bring anybody in. Tried to fix it himself. It's the real deal. So anyway, don't, don't, try to, don't try to walk that road alone. There's, there's freedom in Christ Jesus, but we do this together, all right? So if that's you, reach out. We're here. We're here. We love you, and God has victory for you. Amen? Amen. So if any of this kind of just running in one direction and busy and tired and, and worn out and, and just you feel hurt, you feel burned out, if any of this kind of life describes you at all, there's a way off. You can get off this crazy carnival ride. How many of you like carnival rides? I mean, I'm not a huge fan of them, especially carnival rides, because who knows who put those things together? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's my deal. I look around at like the people who, who like are in charge of the safety of that thing, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I don't think I'd let them cut my grass. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, wow. Anyway, anyway if you're a carny, I'm sorry. I love, I'm sure your heart is there. I'm just, you know, ah. Oh. Anyway, there's a way off the carnival ride is what I'm saying. If you're feeling like you're just being chewed up and spit out by this crazy world, there's a way off of the carnival ride. There is a leader that you can follow who will lead you to the place of hope. It will give you direction, that will give you understanding, that will bring purpose and peace into your life. There's a leader that you can follow. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. You don't have to be aimless. You don't have to feel beat up. You can follow the leader who's going to take you to the right place every time. Every time. You know what Jesus says? And you know what he wants to say to you today? Especially if this is you, if you've been running in this rat race, and it's just like, I'm done. You know what I mean? I'm just so tired. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. That's what my leader says right now. He says, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are tired of trying to make it on your own. Come to me, all of you who have just been run over and then run over again by this painful world. Come to me. And Jesus says, I will give you rest. Now that's a leader to follow. And that's no joke, and he means it. When he says that he'll give you rest, he'll give you rest like, like you don't understand or, 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 or even imagine. I mean, he gives you like real rest, like, like not just, wow, I woke up from a good night's sleep, but like it just permeates through your entire being. Just rest. Rest and peace. All right? Go back to Israel. Back to Israel. Actually, I want to go back to Israel. Honey, we got to go back to Israel soon. Anyway, we'll go back to Israel in the Word right now. Back to Israel. Israel dealt with no leader, and so there was no direction, no restraint, and that's no good. So no leadership in this nation created an environment of anything goes. I mean, like anything. Read it. You'll see it. Anything goes. Check it out. It says again in verse 6 of, of chapter 17, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. They had no leader, so they had no direction, and everybody just did what they thought was right. Point number two, moral relativism has dire consequences. We're going to talk about moral relativism because that's what Israel jumped headlong into and what they discovered where it would take them. Moral relativism, big time bad consequences. 
Here's moral relativism in a nutshell. You can have your truth. I can have my truth. And that's all good. Doesn't that feel good? You got your truth. I got my truth. And we're all right. Everyone's right. Everyone feels kumbaya. Let's sing kumbaya and then get run over by a train. Because that's basically where it takes you. I mean, I'm serious, man. That's where it takes you, right? It sounds so good. It sound, it's like a teddy bear. It's so, so good. You know what I'm saying? But the teddy bear's like got a bomb and it. it's going to blow up. And anyway, I watched too many movies maybe. But, you know, I mean, that's moral relativism. It's a depraved humanistic ideology. It's humanistic and it's depraved. It's like totally broken and void of God. Moral relativism is. But it's the prevailing philosophy of our day. I mean, look, we have, I started getting it even in school, just a little bit. But there have been two generations in our nation that have been like force fed this kind of theology. It's a theology. They've been force fed this theology, this ideology that there are no moral absolutes. That you know what, there's, there's many right answers to the same question. That there's all kinds of ways that are right. Every way, every, every ideology, every philosophy, all religions, all opinions, hey, they're equally valid. And there's no way to really distinguish between any of them. So they're all good. Let's just embrace them all and say, we're all right. We're all right. And who are you to tell me that I'm not? We're all right. Another word for this is tolerance. Have you all heard that word? Of course you have, right? You're breathing, so you've heard the word. You're in America. Tolerance. Tolerance. Moral relativism and tolerance. They go hand in hand. They're essentially the same. I want to give you a a quote that actually is from Dorothy Sayers. I found it uh, from reading some of Chuck Colson's stuff. Dorothy Sayers observed, and she said, In the world it is called tolerance, but in hell it is called despair. The sin that believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive because there is nothing for which it will die. Tolerance. Moral relativism. Depraved humanistic ideology. No wonder we have such growing suicide rates in this nation. There's nothing right to grab hold of. There's nothing right to live for. There's no reason. When this is your your philosophy, your ideology, your theology for life, there's no reason. There's no right. There's no wrong. There's nothing to live for. There's nothing to die for. We have two generations that have grown up And they've been force-fed this. And it's killing them. Killing them. David Kinnaman, he is Pastor Gary Kinnaman's son. So David Kinnaman bought the Barna Group many years ago, probably been 10 years or more ago. He actually bought it from George Barna. And um, by the way, you can be praying for David Kinnaman's wife, Jill. She has actually just moved to hospice with... With brain cancer, it's, it's really, really, really a hard season for the Kinnaman family right now. So continue to pray for Jill. Um, but, you know, David Kinnaman with the Barna Group, the dude knows how people are thinking. I mean, it's his job to study what people are doing and why they're doing it, including Christians. And this is what David Kinnaman has to say about our society. He says that the highest good according to our society, not according to God, but the highest good according to our society is finding yourself and then living by what's right for you. I mean, the guy studies what makes people tick in this nation. And what makes people tick, what they think they're supposed to do is find themselves and then live by what they think is right. That's the prevailing philosophy and ideology of our day to day. And it was back in the day of Judges, chapter 17 through 21. It's 
not new. Man, is it dangerous. You know, the prophet Micah declared those many years ago. He says, he has shown you, speaking of God, God has shown you, O man, what is good. God has shown you, O man, what is good. Do you want to know how a moral relativist would respond to that? Who is he to tell me what is good? Who is God to tell me what is right? I determine what's right. And God's got to be okay with that. I mean, that's where we are in the world today. It just is, you know, we need, to, we need to be real. We need to talk about this in the church. We need to talk about reality in the church. We need to have our eyes open because we're the ones called to be salt and light and to bring the change, to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. You know, that, that, that's what, so we got to know what battle we're, we're launching into. We got we to have eyes to understand the enemy and what makes them tick. And so we study the word of God and we see what makes people tick and, and what has caused these destructive situations that we find ourselves in right now. So that's why we're looking into all this. I'm not trying to do doom and gloom because if you were here last week, you understand this about me, that I don't really, I don't fear what's going on in the world today. I'm excited. You're like, why are you excited about all this? I'm not excited about people getting hurt. I'm not excited about God being dishonored and all that. But you know what I'm excited about? Is that I get to live and minister in a time when things are blowing up. I get to minister in the middle of a storm. I get to bring hope in the middle of a storm. I get to bring Jesus in the middle of a storm. I mean, this isn't like sleep through life kind of time for a Christian. This is like all hands on deck. What an exciting time to be alive as a Christian. So this stuff is not doom and gloom, but it's real. It's real. So now we know what we're dealing with, and we can get on it. You know what I'm saying? We can get into it. In that quote, I'm just remembering, in that quote, it says that those who uh, are in that place of tolerance or despair, it says they interfere with nothing. They interfere with nothing. May the church interfere right now. We need to interfere because we know truth, and we know what's happening to people right now in this broken world. Let's be a church of people that interfere. You know, that's salt and light. You know, Jesus called us to be interferers. He called us to interfere the the status quo, to interfere with it, to get in the middle of it, to shake it up a little bit, to challenge it. He called us to do that. So anyway, this destructive ideology, it's, again, religiously taught to our kids. Prophet Micah talked about it, you know, all that stuff. I want to look at some consequences, though about moral relativism. What does it produce? Let's look at what it produced in our nation. We can't build enough prisons in our nation. Why? Because every did, everyone did what they felt was right in their own eyes. All right, I got to talk about this. Um, prison reform, sentencing reform. I'm so grateful that our president has done something about that assigned into law, some executive orders for, for prison reform. I, I just, let me talk openly. You know, I talk a lot about abortion, about the, the evil of that, and, and, and until that stain is removed, all the other things are going to remain broken, period. If, if a country cannot protect and love the least of these and care for life at the beginning, then it will never care for life along the way. It just won't. I mean, that, that's just impossible. If, if you get it wrong at the beginning, it, it's not going to fix itself over here anywhere. Right? So why, do you, why, is, why is abortion the issue? Because it's the beginning of life. And I want to make sure that life is blessed and protected from the beginning and all the way through. we got to start at the beginning. But I also want to talk about some other things right now. Um, prison reform, sentencing reform. You're like, what, what's up with that? Here's my little rant for the week, all right? Here, here it is, all right? Um, Lord's been giving me these rants. Another pastor taught me about this. I kind of enjoy it. I kind of like just going off on things and just talking about things. And so um, here's the deal. It... If we, want, if we want heaven on earth, if we, want, if we want to see God's heart impacting every area of our culture today, then it needs to impact every area of our culture. All right? So you got, you got, you got an 18-year-old, for instance, who goes and does something stupid because he's running with the wrong people. Did any of you run with wrong people when you were a young man, young woman, and do something stupid? And maybe you just were, I'll say, lucky enough not to get caught. But this young man, he got caught with some drugs in his pocket, like full of them. 
And because of the way that our sentencing and prison and all this stuff works, he got put in adult jail, because he's 18 now, and even if he's 17, for 20 years. Is that the heart of God? Does God say, you messed up 20 years, you're done, and we're going to pretty much write you off for the rest of your life? Or is the heart of God one of reconciliation? Is he, the one, is he a God that wants, that wants to help reconcile somebody, that wants to redeem? Is he the redeemer? Well, I'm going to tell you what, as Christians, we also need to speak into this area of our culture too. We need, we need to bring the heart of Christ into every sphere of our culture. Every sphere. I just had to go off on that for a little bit. Because our nation is messed up in the area of prison and, and sentencing and all that. Why? Because everybody did what they felt was right in their own eyes. And so what do we have? We have a messed up system. Nearly half of our children are being raised without a dad in the home. That's messed up. That is so destructive. You want to know why? Oh, man, it's bad. Because why, though? Everyone did what they felt was right in their own eyes. You know? I just want to kind of live life my way and do things my way and not have any responsibility. And you know what? I decided that that's the right way to live, and so who are you to tell me it's not the right way to live? You know? Those kids will figure it out, you know, whatever, whatever. Suicide at an all-time high in our nation. Why? Because everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. That's why we are here. Abortions are killing off the next generation. Over 60 million people, I think it's 62 million people. I cannot, it's, it's disgusting. Why? Why are they dead? Because everyone's doing what they felt was right in their own eyes. Justifying it. Calling Evil, good, good, evil. I mean, just, it's crazy. Our children are being told that they can choose their gender. And then society pays for them to mutilate their own bodies. Why? Because everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. You see where this stuff leads? It, it, it just goes from bad to worse to worser. I know that's not a word, but I just thought I'd use it anyway. That's where it goes. Cities are on fire because everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes, you know? Pedophilia. You're like, Pastor, you said that word like three times in the last two months. Because if the church doesn't talk about this evil and this sin that is trying to, um, trying to become normal in our culture, then shame on us. I'm just telling you, I know we're not to shame one another. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But, but come on, we got to talk about it. We did not talk and stand up when marriage was redefined in our nation. We were too quiet. We did not interfere enough. We just didn't. We, we have to interfere right now as it relates to this. There's a state right next door to us, California. They're going to hell in a handbasket as far as I'm concerned over there right now. They're believers, praise God. They're rising up, all that kind of stuff. But listen, they're, they're, like, they're like making laws and like passing laws that allow adults. Anyway, I don't even want to talk about that. We have to, this is where it goes when everybody does what's right in their own eyes. This kind of stuff was happening at the end of Judges in the nation of Israel. It's unfortunately alive and well right now in our nation, and somebody's got to interfere. And you know what? That's us. That's us. we got to interfere because righteousness exalts a nation, but sin brings disgrace to any people, Proverbs 14. So we got a messed up, messed up nation. It's messed up because we've disconnected from God's absolute truth. So let's get back to talking about that. And Let's just talk about this too. Our lives, we're talking about a nation, but let's get real here. Our lives get messed up when we disconnect and pull away from God's absolute truth. You've probably seen it in your own life. When you've chosen something that you thought was right in your own eyes and you thought, ah, a little bit of that's not a big deal. It messed you up, didn't it? Messed up your relationships, didn't it? It'll mess you up. It'll mess you up. So here's a question for each one of us. Now, this is a question for you. Who has set the standards by which you live? Is it pop culture? Is it the media? Is it Hollywood? Is it these professional athletes who they think they know what's going on now? And how about college professors? Do some of you still need to get some deliverance for some of the stuff that you were taught when you went to college? Some of this craziness, maybe you do. Or have you set your own standards? Have you set your own standards? Because if you have, that's not the right answer. I did a daily dose devotion two, three weeks ago, and I titled it, Don't Vote Your Values. 
kind of a shock factor. What do you mean? Pastor's telling us not to vote our values. I thought we were supposed to be value voters. Yeah, we're supposed to be value voters, but I don't want you voting your values. I want you voting these values right here. Because I'll tell you what, you've, had, you've come in contact with just enough mess in your life to where, you know, as much as we think our values are in 100% alignment with this, there's enough stuff that's stuck along the way that's just kind of messed us up just enough. You know what I'm saying? So let's not be so proud to think that, that our individual values are the value by which, you know, we should vote and everybody should do life, right? But this is. This right here is. And so I guess my point is, is that have you set your own standards? I hope not. Parents, let me talk about this. Who's setting the standards in your kid's life? Just look at what they're taking in. That's what's setting the standard programming them. You know what? On TV, they used to call it TV program. It's coming to me. TV programming. You know, they would, they would have their programming. Each station had their, their, their programming, right? How appropriate is that? That's exactly what all this stuff from the world is doing. It's programming people. It's programming us. Dude, get your, I keep using that word. I don't know why. I'm just in a mood today, but this is where we need to get our programming. If you're new, I don't usually use that word, all right? I'm a little more formal than that, you know, but anyway. <laughs> this is what needs to be programming us, not what's coming out of the screens. I keep preaching that, and I keep going, darn it, man. It, keep, it keeps hitting home, you know what I mean? All right, I got to be careful what I'm watching. Check this out with kids. This is a, a scary statistic. Only 6% of teens... And only 9% of born-again teens believe in moral absolutes. Programming. I told you there's been two generations that have been force-fed this garbage. That have been programmed into believing in moral absolutes. And that everybody can be right at the same time. And that's somehow the loving way to live. Meanwhile... Their friends are committing suicide at a higher rate than we've ever seen in the world today. You know what I mean? It's tragic. I hate it. It's so tragic. And again, I just want to underscore, if you're dealing with that kind of darkness, you know, come talk, talk, talk. This is real. It's no joke. And it's the plan of the devil. God has a way of life for you. Let's cut to the chase. We'll close in the next hour or so. All right. The Bible tells us, that the Bible tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, judgment. That's the way it is. We're going to all die. Unless Jesus comes back this afternoon. Then the dead in Christ will rise first, meet him in the clouds, and we'll follow. Get our resurrected bodies at that time. Isn't that awesome? So come on, don't be thinking there's anything more important in your life right now. Well, I just want to wait till my kid gets married. No, no, Jesus, come back, all right? Stop, stop praying that, by the way. We want Jesus to come back, right? That's what we really need, right? Because when he comes back, perfect leadership. Perfect leadership happens. Thousand-year millennial kingdom reign. Oh, my goodness, come on, Jesus. Right, but there is appointed a time for man to die. Every one of us. And then a time of judgment. Scripture tells us that one day, every one of us, small and great, we're going to stand before God to be judged. That's in Revelation. So what will be the standards for judgment in that day? Will it be the standards of this world? Will God use a moral relativistic form of, of, of judgment in that day? <laughs> it's going to be the standards that God has established Here's a cool thing. God isn't keeping a secret from us. He gives us the standards right here. He's not doing any switch and bait. He's not trying to confuse us. I mean, it's, just, I mean, it's black and white and red in some places, right? Hopefully you've read the whole thing. But anyway, black and white. And, um, standing before the Lord and, and hoping that he's going to judge by any other standards, it's a bad place to be. The nation of Israel was in a state of moral free fall and decay. We're in the same place. But here's a question I have for you this morning. What about you? Where are you with all this? How's your life? What about your life? What are you following? What are you following? And where's it taking you? How are you going to know what you're following? Where's it taking you? 
Is what you're following taking you closer to God in intimacy with Him? Or is what you're following taking you further into the world in friendship with the world? It's really one of two things. Just look at your life. You want to know your condition. You want to know who and what you're following. Look at your schedule. Is your time, is your heart, is it all going toward closeness with God? Or is it being pulled more and more into the busyness rat race of this world? What's getting your first and your best? So where are you? Where are you? Point number three, and we'll finish up quickly. Point number three, it's good news. Absolute truth leads to eternal life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Absolute truth leads to eternal life. The book of Judges ends with the same statement. Remember I said it says it four times. It says that in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit, right? But that's not how... That's not how I want my life to end. I don't want that to be the last chapter. I don't want that to be the last thing said about about me. I want the book of my life to read as follows. I want want the last thing said about me is Eric had a king. His name is Jesus. And Eric didn't do what he thought was right. He did what his king said was right. And then you know what the next statement's going to be? It's going to be that Eric is enjoying eternal life with his king. I mean, that, that is what God desires the last chapter, the last statement of your life to be. That you have a king. Not just a buddy, not just a happy thought, but you have a king. And his name is Jesus. And that, that you do what your king has called you to do and be who he's called you to be. And that you're enjoying eternal life with your king. That's God's plan and desire for your life. It's not the plan of this world, but it's God's plan for you. Absolute truth. It's right here. It's right here. Do you want that to be the last thing said about your life? Grab hold of this truth. Don't let all the other noise pull you away from this truth. I want to read Psalm 119, beginning in verse 105. This should be our prayer. This should be our way of life right here. Your word, O God, it's a lamp for my feet. Your word, your absolute truth, it's the light on my path. Now check this out. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. Just stop there for a moment. Maybe there's some of us here today that need to make that kind of commitment and statement before the Lord. That I have determined with everything in me that what I'm going to follow is this, the righteous laws, is your ways, God, absolute truth. Verse 107, I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Do you know that God's absolute truth and his heart and his plan for your life is to preserve your life? That when we walk with him, our life is preserved. When our life is in him, in him alone, it's preserved. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. You know, we need God to help us know his laws. That's why we got to be spirit-filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I started understanding the Word of God like at a whole nother level. It was like I got a master's or, or PhD just like that because all of a sudden the eyes of my heart were enlightened because I'm not reading through the natural anymore, but I spiritual eyes to see. Though I constantly take my life in my own hands, dude, mess up here and there, but I get up consecrated to God. I will not forget your law, God. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 5, verse 31. He said that the prophets prophesy lies. This was a bad time too, right? The prophets prophesy lies and the priests rule by their own authority 
And my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? Hey, everybody's going this direction. Everybody's saying this is right. Everybody's saying this is the way to live. Okay, whatever. The question for you today is, but what will you do in the end? What will you do even today? Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to trust with your eternity? There's a path that seems right unto men, but in the end, this path leads to death. And so the question I have is, are you on the right path? I believe the question the Lord has and wants you to examine. You know, it's good for us to examine our lives. Search me, O oh God. See if there's any wicked way in me. And say, search me, O oh God. Am I on the right path? Have I been embracing garbage? Have I been fully embracing you? Are you on the right path? Are you prepared to stand before God and give an account for how you've spent your life and where you've given your allegiance and where you've put your trust? I've tried. I think I've, done, I've tried, but I don't, I'm just not feeling it, Pastor. I've tried. What do I do? I keep trying. I keep trying. I keep pushing. I keep trying. That's been you. I just want to say, here's what God wants to tell you. Just turn your life over to me. And let me do the heavy lifting. It's God's message for you. Just follow me. Allow me to be your leader. And I'll lead you into truth. And I'll lead you into freedom. And I'll lead you into peace. I'll lead you into new life. I'll set you free. Just follow me. Because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's the message of Jesus, King of Kings, for you today, for all of us today. Why don't you stand up?